Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Improving Assessments and Assignments to Increase Equity. My name is Harriet Hobbs, and I have the pleasure of being one of the co-presenters. You will have an opportunity to hear from my colleagues, Dr. Christine Robinson and Dr. Karen Signa Freeman, who are also co-presenting. If you would, please take a moment to complete a brief survey to help us better understand this work. You can type the link in your search engine or simply scan the QR code using your cell phone. If you would like to be a part of this research, be sure to click, select, and submit at the end of the survey. So let's get started. So now in terms of what brings us to this work, from my positionality, I am an African-American female who has been in the field of assessment for 20 years and now a fourth year doctoral student. I am committed to social justice and higher education by helping to close the equity gaps through my research. More importantly, in the area of assessment, I want to see assessment transcend from the traditional way that assessment has typically been done to better uh, close those equity gaps in terms of student learning and also to work with like-minded assessment scholars and practitioners to move away from a deficit framework that blames the students but fails to examine systems and practices that impede upon underrepresented minority students academic success. So hi, I'm Karen Singer Freeman. And, um, you know, as Harriet said, we think that this talk will be a little bit more interesting to you if you take a minute and think about what's bringing you to this work. Um, so, you know, if you want, you can pause now or later and take some notes to yourself about what's bringing you here. Um, for me, what's bringing me to the work is I've had a long-standing concern for social justice. Um, so I started off as a psychology faculty member and increasingly became interested in research that um, examined questions of social justice and higher education in terms of access um, and having the necessary supports to succeed in higher education. Um, as a faculty member of 20 years, I'm really interested in quality teaching. And so I think when we start to look at questions of assessment and social justice, that feeds directly into quality teaching because um, I think all faculty believe that we want to be accurately assessing student learning. And if there's bias in our assessments, we're failing to do that. So that brings me to my interest in quality assessment. Um, I transitioned from being a faculty member to being in an office of assessment and accreditation where I am now. And a lot of what made that move for me interesting was that it gives me the opportunity to reach many faculty and um, higher education professionals and help them to create assessments that will be both more accurate and more equitable. Um, and I think I'm going to pass it off to our colleague Christine now, and she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the influence of thought leaders in her own remarks. So hello, I'm Christine Robinson. Uh, so it was a few years ago, or actually last year, where I participated in a keynote track session at the IUPUI assessment conference. And the name of that uh, talk was Why Equity and Assessment Must Be Inextricably, Inextricably, inextricably linked to student success. And it was offered by Dr. Tia McNair, who's the Vice President um, for Diversity, Equity, and Student Success at AACNU. Additionally, I've read some research by Natasha Jankowski and Eric Montenegro. Um, they put out a paper in 2017 and then a more recent one in 2020 in relationship to equity and assessment. And in that, they address the importance of examining assessment and its impact on student success. Personally, um, I am, you know, interested in this work because of my uh, challenges and experiences as a woman of color being educated in predominantly white K-12 and higher education institute, institutions. So all of these encourage me to want to improve the educational experiences and success of underrepresented students. Now, we'd like you to take a few moments and think about and jot down what brings you to this work. All right. 
right. So let's talk about um, some of the learning outcomes we hope uh, will be achieved today. So educational equity requires a thoughtful selection of assignments, the disaggregation of data by student demographic, and the use of findings for improvement. So we are going to introduce you to assignment types, such as exams, papers, et cetera, that can decrease or increase the educational equity gaps. We will then discuss features of those assignment types, utility value, and inclusive content, which if adjusted can increase or decrease educational equity gaps. We will provide you with data from a case so that you can practice examining disaggregated assignment types and its potential impact on students. Our goals overall are to provide you with the tools for you to examine if educational equity gaps exist in your assignments, and if gaps exist, you will have some tools to make changes for improvement. Now, Karen, what is utility value and in inclusive content? Hi, so if you didn't have a chance to complete that survey on our first slide, before moving on with the talk, I encourage you to go back and complete the survey um, because I think it will help you to um, be more involved with the content that I'm about to discuss. So in that survey, um, we asked you to answer a bunch of questions that, um, and the extent to which many questions could be applied to different types of assignments. And these are half of the questions that were in that assignment. And what I want you to do now is you can hit pause on this recording, read over these questions, and think to yourself what you think we were trying to measure with these questions. Um, and if you want sort of extra credit, they're actually grouped there. Um, they're all one construct, but they're grouped under different elements of that construct. And so once you've had a chance to write down your thoughts, then hit play and let the talk continue. When we designed these questions, we were trying to get at a concept that was first proposed by Jacqueline Eccles in the 1970s, and there's a reference to this work at the end of today's talk. Um, and she called it utility value. And utility means usefulness. And so utility value is the idea that assignments vary in the extent to which students believe they're going to be useful to themselves. And so the broadest type of utility value we thought might be captured by a question like, to what extent is this assignment, will this assignment result in something that you would choose to discuss with others? Um, so, you know, things that have value, that's the things we generally want to talk about. Within utility value, there's three different elements. And so now you could pause if you want and think about what these elements are. But the first element is what's referred to as personal utility value, which describes aspects of an experience or an assignment that hold personal value to the individual. And so the questions we designed to get at that are questions like, to what extent does this assignment help you understand yourself better? Or to what extent does this assignment have personal value? Another feature or facet of utility value is academic utility value. And so that gets at the extent to which an assignment or assessment would have value to your future academic success. And the question we designed to tap that is to what extent does this assignment improve your understanding? And then finally, there's professional utility value, which is the extent to which an experience or assignment provides you with experience that will be professionally useful. The second set of questions that you answered are these. And if you take a minute again and pause the recording and think about what you think we're trying to measure here. So what we're trying to measure in all of these is something that we refer to as inclusive content. And, you know, oftentimes I think when people discuss inclusive content, um, they're using a, a more narrow definition than we're using here. And that's why I think it's really useful to take a minute and consider each of these questions and how they relate to inclusive content. So if broadly inclusive content describes the extent to which materials that you provide to students and assignments that you give to students 
provide everybody with equal access to um, success, then within that context, I think these questions start to make sense. So allowing me to express learning in my own words gets at the idea that students' um, linguistic um, style won't interfere with their ability to demonstrate their learning. Makes me feel confident that I can see can succeed is getting at the idea that when students feel that everybody has an equal shot at an assignment, they feel that they are more confident that they can succeed. Allows me to relate class material to my own experiences, means that students who don't feel that they might be limiting an experience that's assumed by the instructor. Measures my true understanding as opposed to being influenced by an artifact like unequal access. Um, includes examples and materials that are familiar to me, gets at the idea that whatever is um, assumed knowledge in assignment should have either been taught in the class or should be equally familiar to all students, and includes clear instructions, gets at the idea that when assignments are inclusive, the instructions will make it so that you don't need to rely on previous experience or access to more experienced family members in order to succeed on the task. So these are the measures we came up with. And now I'm going to pass off to my colleague Harriet and she's going to tell you a little bit about the theory behind why we think these two elements of assignments are critical for equity in assessment. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in 2019, my colleagues and I had the opportunity to publish an article in the assessment update. And the title of that article is A Theoretical Matrix of Culturally Relevant Assessment, where we discuss elements of assignment types that can perpetuate equity gaps. Since the article, we have refined this work to focus on two elements of culturally relevant assessment, which are increasing utility value and inclusive content. As we move through these elements of culturally relevant assessment, keep in mind um, both utility value and inclusive content are described as best practices for all students. Most importantly, failing to consider these elements can interfere with the student's ability to do their best work. So the first element is increasing utility value in assignment types. Now, utility value is the extent to which students perceive assignments to have value to them beyond the context of the course or grade. Karen mentioned earlier, Eccles in her research discusses professional, academic, and personal utility value. Professional utility value is where students see that the skill will be useful in their professional career. In addition, Heraclitus in her research found that when students are asked to explain the importance of scientific material to their own lives, equity gaps were reduced for gen first generation and underrepresented minority students. Academic utility value fosters skills to help students succeed in current or future classes. Now, personal utility value is providing content within the assignments that students consider that is relevant in helping them to better understand themselves. Another element is inclusive content, which considers assignments that are aligned with teaching and student learning. Anytime we test students on information that we have not taught, we are disproportionately harming those students who have less preparation and less confidence. When we ask students to apply or demonstrate learning using an example, it is critical that the example be equally familiar to all students. We must be sure that assignments and teaching are well aligned with the learning outcomes that we are trying to achieve. Therefore, if assessment and teaching are poorly aligned, it will increase equity gaps in student learning. So the use of accessible materials is important in inclusive content. And this is referring to the cost of textbooks or other required materials. When expensive textbooks are used instead of open educational resources, students who have limited economic resources might not be able to purchase the book at the beginning of the se semester and may wait later on in the semester to purchase the book. 
This has found to have serious implications for their ability to complete the course and successfully uh, and do successfully in the class as well. We must also be sure to include clear detailed instructions. For example, when instructions are unclear, students who have stronger academic preparation will likely be able to understand the instructor's intentions using their previous experiences with similar tasks. So therefore, students from privileged groups will feel more comfortable asking for clarification, while historically underrepresented groups may not feel comfortable asking for clarification. Another element of culturally relevant assessment within inclusive content is scaffold. Assignments should be scaffold. So this means that assignments should build on, later assignments should build on knowledge and competencies that are practiced in early assignments. Early assignments should include detailed prompts and instructions that allow all students to succeed. Scaffold assignments help students have early success in the class, and this can build trust and prepare students to persist when assignments become more difficult. An inclusive environment, which avoids stereotype threat. A stereotype threat describes situations in which individuals believe that they are at risk of conforming to negative stereotypes about their group. Still, et al. posit that stereotypes can threaten how students evaluate themselves, which can alter their academic identity and their intellectual performance. Also, inclusive environment includes having diverse faculty and teaching support in the class. So in summary, inclusive content limits effects of prior knowledge when students receive all of the information they need to succeed on an assignment. Therefore, all students have equal chances to succeed. In contrast, if instructions are incomplete or some expectations are unstated, those who have completed similar assignments in previous classes will benefit from their past experiences where other students may be at a disadvantage. So based on a theoretical analysis of assignment types, <clears throat> reflective writing assignments are considered low risk in producing equity gaps because they are high in inclusive content and high utility value. And the reason why is because students are asked to describe and apply content to their life experiences, which are culturally inclusive. Students generally report that these types of assignments are high in utility value. Therefore, you should see less evidence of equity gaps in student achievement. Now, assignments that are considered moderate risk of producing equity gaps are writing in the discipline. And writing in the discipline is low in inclusive content. However, it is high in utility value because this type of writing is done by professionals in a discipline and students perceive these assignments to have value because they need this skill in their professional, academic, or personal life. Inclusive projects, they are high in inclusive content because they're aligned with teaching and learning, has clear detailed instructions, and examples are equally familiar to all students. It also provides students with choices that can be of inclusive content, yet inclusive projects has a low utility value. Now let's talk about the assignments that are considered high risk of producing equity gaps, and those are formal essays and tests. Now, formal essays, and particularly tests, they have complicated sentence structures, not always aligned with teaching and learning, and can evoke stereotype threat. They are perceived as having low utility value and low inclusive content. So we can expect that these types of assignments are most likely to reveal equity gaps. So Harriet has just presented our theoretical analysis that um, was um, where we started this work. And now I'm going to take you quickly through some of our supportive data. So the first thing we were interested in doing was finding out whether the questions we had designed did in fact um, appear to be measuring something that students saw as um, a construct within those assignments. 
and um, what students thought about assignments because what we just presented to you was what we imagined students thought and we all know as assessment practitioners that we need to ask the students. Um, so we actually started with 16 items um, originally that we had written to assess utility value, inclusive content and alignment. And we asked quite a few students, 162 students from a range of upper and lower level classes to complete a survey very much like the one you completed at the beginning of this workshop. Um, and then we had 32 faculty and staff who completed the same survey. And if you chose to um, submit your results to that survey, we'll be adding your results in to our next talk. Um, and what we asked the students to do was answer these questions that we've already gone over together. Um, the questions like in the survey you completed were not grouped into that utility value and inclusive content, um, but I'm just reminding you these were the questions again. Um, and I want you to notice that there's one additional question under the dotted line here. Um, this assignment is only completed to earn a grade. And we ended up taking that question out because pretty much all students said everything was only completed to earn a grade. So it wasn't very good at differentiating assignments for us. A little discouraging. Um, but for those of you that like creating measures and things, these two constructs of utility value and inclusive content um, had high inter item reliability, meaning students appeared to answer them similarly for different assignments, and that's reflected in the Cromvax alpha of 0 0.90 and 0 0.93 that you can see under the two measures. Um, the other items that did not seem to work so well, we removed, and so we haven't shared with them, you with them in this talk. And, you know, the one other thing that was interesting is when we first started this work, we were thinking of alignment as separate from inclusive content. But as we looked at students' responses and thought about it more, we realized that we needed to expand our definition of inclusive content to the one that we shared with you today, because we recognized that having good alignment actually makes your content more inclusive, because it evens the playing field in terms of effects of prior experience and privilege. So then, just as you did at the beginning of this session, the students were asked to answer each of those questions for each of these sorts of assignments. And you can see the full description of the assignments here. And in each case, they selected not at all, a little to a moderate extent or very much. And so if you want to read those questions in more, or the assignment types in more detail, you can pause here. But I'm going to move on to show you what we found. So now what you can see is students for each um, item responded with a number between one and four, from not at all to extremely, I think it was. Um, and what is, is shown in this graph is the average rating across all of the utility value items that students gave for each of the seven different types of assignments. So you can see along the x-axis, it says writing in the discipline, oral presentation, inclusive project, reflective writing, formal papers, short answer tests, and multiple choice tests. And you can see that they're, they're ranked, I have them listed in the, in, from high to low order. And we conducted analysis of variance to determine which differences were significant between assignments. And these boxes show you which assignments were significantly different roughly from the neighboring assignments. So writing in the discipline and oral presentations were viewed as having the highest utility value, followed by inclusive projects and reflective writing, followed by formal papers and short answer tests, followed by multiple choice tests. So pretty close to what we predicted prior to asking students. Um, the one thing that was a surprise to us was writing in the discipline was viewed by students as having high utility value. And as we thought about that, um, oh, I'm sorry, but we did predict that. So then we asked faculty and staff. Um, and so once again, the boxes are showing where the significant differences were. Um, the one thing that you may notice as you look at this is for the most part, 
faculty and staff think assignments are higher in utility value than students do, which, you know, probably shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to us. But what I really want you to notice is besides that, um, the pattern of which assignments are viewed as having high or low utility value has stayed the same. So once again, writing in the discipline and oral presentations are the highest, followed by inclusive writing, inclusive projects, reflective writing, and formal papers, followed by different forms of testing. Now we're going to look at the same thing for inclusive content. And what you may notice here is these means are a lot more similar to each other. So once again, we have the average rating on the y-axis and the type of assignment being rated on the x-axis. And um, But here, the scores only range from 2.8 to 2.5. And when we looked at the scores that differed from each other significantly, there's a whole big chunk of them up at the top. Um, and then once again, formal papers and multiple choice tests are, are significantly lower. Um, students had the opportunity to write in comments. And one thing that showed up frequently was that it was really hard to assess inclusive content in a an assignment in general because it mattered who was giving the assignment. So some faculty would give the exact, you know, reflective writing that would have high inclusive content, whereas others would give that same assignment, but it would have low inclusive content. And then if we look at what faculty say, once again, faculty seem to be a little bit more optimistic. So generally thinking that assignments have more inclusive content than students do, but once again, showing the same basic pattern of difference. Um, the only thing that was um, different here is formal papers, faculty and staff believed were as high in inclusive content as any of the other measures, and it was only multiple choice tests that were significantly lower. So if we were going to update our model based on the feedback that we got from um, faculty, students, and staff, we would say that the assignments where we would expect not to see equity gaps would be reflective writing, writing in the discipline, oral reports, and inclusive projects, because they were all relatively high in inclusive content and utility value. Um, whereas the assignments that we would expect to see equity gaps are formal essays and all types of tests based on their relatively lower inclusive content and utility value. Um, so the one thing you may notice have changed here is that writing in the discipline has moved up. Um, and that was because writing in the discipline students viewed as having higher inclusive content than we had predicted they would view. So now I'm going to take you through the research that's reported in our 2019 paper. The reference for that paper is at the end, so if you want to read more about it, you can go there. Um, but we looked at data from three classes. The first class was a community college class in theater appreciation. It had 64 students and it was a majority minority class. So 69% of the students came from underrepresented ethnic minority groups, which included um, African American, Hispanic Latinx, Native American, and Pacific Islander students. And what we found was here you can see the average percent underrepresented ethnic minority students and non underrepresented ethnic minority students received for inclusive projects and multiple choice exams. So the underrepresented ethnic minority students are represented by those turquoise bars and the non underrepresented minority students, which included white and Asian students are represented by gold bars. And when you look at the inclusive project results, those differences were not statistically significant. So students were doing equal, equivalently well on their inclusive project assignments. Whereas the multiple choice tests, there was a statistically significant equity gap such that non-URM students received significantly higher grades than URM students. We also looked at child development, which was a large general education class from a public liberal arts college. It enrolled 110 students and was 44% underrepresented ethnic minority. And you'll see a similar-ish pattern emerge here. So in that class, there was two different types of assignments. 
students did self-reflective writing where they were asked to summarize a content area, discuss how that content helped explain their life or the life of somebody they cared about, and then um, prioritize the information from that unit that they'd like to remember in order to be a better influence on children in the future. So those are the reflective writing assignments. Students also took the class either um, as an in-person class or online. And it was exactly the same open book, open multiple choice quiz questions in both settings. The, what we found was that there was not a significant equity gap for reflective writing or online quizzes, but when students were asked to do those quizzes in person, there was a significant equity gap. And so that's those middle two bars where the underrepresented ethnic minority students averaged 77 um, and the non underrepresented ethnic minority students averaged 85. We were really interested in this because we think this gets to um, creating an inclusive environment. So you'll recall that Harriet was talking about the dangers of invoking feelings of stereotype threat, which is when you feel that people have a negative stereotype about your ability in some area. And so perhaps being in a large lecture hall with, I was the professor in this class, so a white faculty member at the front of the room would interfere with underrepresented ethnic minority students' ability to fully um, attend to and succeed on the task because that setting invoked stereotype threat in a way that an online test with the same questions did not. And then finally, we looked at an upper level psychology class, um, experimental psychology, also from a public liberal arts college. For this class, we did something that um, Christine is going to be telling you about in a few minutes because the class generally enrolled 25 to 35 students. We took data across five semesters so that we would have enough um, students to conduct statistical analyses. The class was 30% underrepresented ethnic minority. And in this class, the, the differences are, are a little bit um, more complicated to understand. But there were two major forms of assessment in this class. The first was that students wrote three complete lab reports where they had to read primary source literature and summarize it. Um, identify a gap in the literature, propose an experiment and explain how it would add to the literature, write a method section for the experiment, conduct the experiment, collect data, analyze the data, put all that in there, and write up a discussion section that explained how the data spoke to the hypothesis and added to the existing literature. So it was really a full out psychology report, they had to do three of those and it measured everything we wanted them to know in that class. We also had um, open-ended exam questions where they were given a list of maybe 50 to 60 possible questions before the exam so they knew what was gonna be on the exam and then it was an in-class proctored exam, essay exam. Um, and so I want you first to look at the non-URM bars that are in bold. And so that 80% in those lab reports, the writing and the discipline, was not statistically different than the 76% on the open-ended exam questions. But then when you look at the underrepresented ethnic minority students represented in turquoise, the 79% on the lab reports that they received was significantly higher than the 73% on those in-class exams. And these results are really important because I was the faculty member in that class and I know that the lab reports were the most authentic measure of their ability to master what they needed in that class to succeed within the major and if they wanted to go to graduate school in psychology, um, but at the time tests were not. And um, so, you know, I think those results are quite compelling. So now I'm gonna pass off to Christine, who's gonna take you through how we applied this at our own institution and what you might wanna do with this sort of work. Thank you, Karen. So exactly what Karen said, you know, we um, gathered information from a, a public community college and a smaller uh, institution. And we wanted to know how our theoretical model 
um, and the placement of uh, the exams and projects where where that fell in uh, at our institution. So what we did was um, we started. Uh, we wanted to know where we would have the most significant impact. So we started with courses that had 50 or more students and where students received a high number of grades of D, F, or W, W for withdrawal. The other uh, piece is that we had to make sure that that information and uh, about students' grades on a different assignments existed in our learning management system. Our learning management system is Canvas. So using those two criteria, we found that there were 88 courses that had large enrollments, high DFW rates, and also had grades within our LMS system. In order to use our model, a course at least needed two different types of assignments. Unfortunately, most of the classes, most of those 88 classes that had high DFW rates um, were STEM classes, and they only had one type of assignment. And you guessed it, exams and tests, which we had determined are low in utility value and low in inclusive content. So our analysis is based upon eight classes. We excluded the other 80 classes. And all eight of these classes, every one of them had tests and at least one other type of assignment. It could have been a paper or a project or homework. So let me talk next about how we went about disaggregating the information. So we downloaded the information again from our LMS system, Learning Management System Canvas. That allowed us to see students' grades by assignment. Additionally, we were also able to pull up the syllabi and really review it to see what assignment types were given and how those were weighted by the faculty member. So some things that decisions that we had to make along the way were, one is when a class was taught by the same instructor using the same, same assignments over more than one semester, we included all of that information um, from all of the sections um, because sometimes the N of just using one section was a little bit too small, so we aggregated the sections. We also included missing assignments. We converted those to zeros. So if the assignment had points attached to them, then we were able to um, discriminate uh, between uh, points on that assignment. Next, we decided to exclude completion-based assignments or those assignments where um, faculty members give a check mark or not because it wasn't really clear to us how those factored into the grades. We decided to combine multiple grades of the same type of student work into one grade. So for example, in uh, an engineering class, you could have 10 different homeworks rather than assess using homework one, two, and three, we combined all of the homeworks into one um, uh, grade. For consistency, we converted anything that we saw was point related, we converted it to percentages so that there was consistency throughout. Lastly, we made a request to institutional research based upon the students who were in these classes and they were able to provide us with a demographic analysis and they mapped that information to those assignments for each of the students. Now I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of what classes, those eight classes that were included in our research. So you'll see the first four classes, which are pre-calculus, organic chemistry lab, introduction to communication theory, and network theory. Those four classes were introductory classes. The second set of four classes, principles of accounting, phys physiological psychology, sociology of health and illness, and conservation biology, those were more advanced level classes. Uh, a majority, again, as I indicated, of the assessments that came out of these classes were exams, tests, and quizzes, but they, they did have some other, at least one other differentiated type of assignment, especially in the more advanced level classes. Karen. So now I'm gonna take you quickly through some data um, and um, I'm, I'm staying on this slide for a minute because when we get to the next slide, it's going to look a little overwhelming, but I'm going to talk you through it 
And then I'm going to ask you to try and think about it before I tell you what we think about it. Um, and the one thing I wanted to add to our methods is that this data that we're presenting to you today, you, you may have um, sort of heard this through what Christine is saying. These were analyses we did from our Office of Assessment and Accreditation without directly partnering with faculty. Um, and so, um, you know, what she's explained to you is how if you're in an office like ours or an office of teaching and learning, um, you can go in and look at institutional data. It, it can be a lot simpler and this is the stage of the research we're just beginning now when you actually have faculty partners. The value of going in first to just look to see what's out there at your institution, especially in an area like classes that are having high rates of D, F, and W grades, um, is it gives you a sense of whether the work needs to be done, right? So this was our sort of first exploratory work. So now what you're going to see on these two graphs is the number of points that we're separating assignments from students that are well served to students that are underserved. So the top graph you'll see is points separating non-URM from URM. So that's like the previous work I was showing you. The bottom graph is showing you points separating native students, meaning students who began at our institution as freshmen from transfer students. And we were interested in that comparison because there's a fair amount of work that has shown that especially in the first year after transfer, transfer students may be at risk of not succeeding and moving up in classes. And so we were interested in making that comparison as well. So number of points separating is um, in the previous graphs I was showing you, you know, we would have that the URM students were averaging 75 and the non-URM students were averaging 85. If it was 75 versus 85, that would show up in this graph as a 10 point separation. And in each case, positive separations mean that the difference is in the direction of an equity gap. Okay, so positive 10 would mean that on average, non-URM students were receiving 10 points higher on an assignment than URM students. The last thing I need to tell you, and then I'm gonna set you loose for a minute to think about this, is we divided the types of assignments into four categories, which you can see along the x-axis. So MC tests refers to multiple choice tests. FR test responds to free response or open-ended tests. Homework, which was common in many of the classes, describes homework, and that's um, frequent low stakes assignments where students are practicing a skill um, at home. <laughs> and writing included a number of different types of writing assignments. Um, so now I encourage you if you're brave enough. Oh, and then the last thing is you can see that the classes are represented with different colored bars and they're ordered from lower level to upper level. So for example, within multiple choice tests, the furthest bars to the left are the lowest level classes, the most introductory classes, whereas the bars to the furthest right within that category would be the most advanced courses by course number. Um, so now if you're brave, hit pause and see if you can think about what you see here and then hit play when you're ready to hear what I see here. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that I think many of you may have noticed is that all of the bars are above the line. So what that means is in every instance where there was a point difference, and there was a point difference in every one of these assignments we looked at, URM students were receiving lower grades than non-URM students, and transfer students were receiving lower grades than non-transfer students and native students. Now, clearly not all of these differences are significant. So you'll see that our scale ranges from zero points to 15 points. And the biggest difference is in engineering, I think. When you look at URM versus non-URM students, the difference was around 14 points, which is clearly a large difference. Um, we have a paper that's currently in review and should be out soon that actually goes through and does the statistical analyses on these to determine which of these differences are large enough to be significant. Um, but when you just look at 
the frequency and size of differences, I think probably you see some support for the idea that multiple choice tests appear to be more problematic than free response tests. Um, and that homework appears to be somewhat problematic um, with pretty large point differences. And we've been doing a lot of thinking about that, but we think that homework may not have a lot of utility value for students. It wasn't something that was in our original model, um, but we think that may be part of the problem. Um, and so to summarize where we have come based on our analyses of results that are significant, we are seeing frequently statistically significant equity gaps in tests, whether they're low stakes or high stakes, and we're gonna go into this in this paper that's forthcoming, um, whether they're multiple choice or open-ended, although multiple choice does appear to be more problematic, and also whether they're open book or online. So some of those classes were actually online and online classes in several instances had large statistically significant gaps in testing. We also received frequent equity gaps in homework, which wasn't something we necessarily predicted. And within the writing, which you couldn't see because I didn't break out the types of writing, formal writing appears to evoke equity gaps more than any other type of writing. And by formal writing, we mean your sort of classical essay um, where students are expected to, you know, write a thesis, cite textual evidence, um, not, you know, a, a lab report, but more of your formal English essay style of essay. We're seeing infrequent equity gaps in most types of writing, um, oral reports, group projects, e-portfolios, and interestingly, in homework for a flipped class. Um, so you may have noticed when Christine was going through the classes, um, the accounting class was flipped and we did not see an equity gap for the accounting class homework. And in fact, the means were in favor of, um, I believe the underrepresented ethnic minority students received slightly higher grades on that one than other students. So now I'm going to pass it back to Harriet and she's gonna talk about what are our next steps. Great, thank you, Karen. So where do we go from here? It is not enough to identify classes with equity gaps, although it is a start. In our research, we looked at courses that had high grades of D, F, and withdrawals, also known as DFW rates. However, we've expanded that to more um, advanced courses. So attention should be given to the assignment grades received in those courses by disaggregating data to examine where those equity gaps exist. Then work towards increasing utility value in inclusive content as well as alignment. Now Karen and I, we're gonna provide examples to help you increase utility value in inclusive content in the next couple of slides. But in terms of increasing utility value, inclusive content and alignment, there is evidence that support that assignments that have increased utility value and inclusive content equity gaps were reduced. In addition, it is important to survey students to learn about how they perceive or view assignments, and then work to improve existing assignments by including clear and detailed instructions and make sure the assignments align with what we are teaching and what we expect the students to learn. So now let's move on to the discussion. So how how can we increase utility value in assignments? We can increase utility value by explaining how the assignments has, has academic value, professional, personal value to the students. So you can go through the syllabus and ex explain the purpose of each assignment. Perhaps suggest a line that can be added to the student's resume or CV. Explain how the skill will be useful in a future career. For example, in an accounting class, let's say the learning objective may be to evaluate the financial condition of a business by completing a comprehensive problem. Explaining to the student that this skill is needed as a certified public accountant to accurately audit a business or organization will increase professional utility value. And explain how the skill will help the student succeed in future classes will increase their academic utility value. Also, um, you can create content um, to include in the assignments that students consider to be relevant in helping them to better understand themselves 
and this will help increase their personal utility value. Another way to boost utility value is to create what we call social pedagogy. This is simply engaging, simply engaging students around an authentic task. This is where you as a professor curate students' assignments that are important to the students and showcase their work. Some examples may include brochures, videos, or podcasts. Give these assignments back to the students and encourage the students to share these assignments with their family and friends. This will increase utility value because students will see the value of these assignments beyond the context of a grade. Great, so now I'm gonna talk about ways that we can increase inclusive content. Um, and, you know, when you think about um, any assignment, I just want to sort of remind us of that data on inclusive content that students said to us, well, it's hard to say how inclusive a formal essay is in general because different faculty are different. And so even though we've spent a lot of time trying to show you that we think certain types of assignments are inherently riskier when it comes to creating equity gaps, we also believe that any assignment can be improved by attention to these things. So Harriet just discussed ways that you can improve the utility value of any assignment, even a multiple choice test. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the same for ways to increase inclusive content. So the first thing is make sure that your materials are accessible and that has to do with both cost and content. Um, so at the very beginning, Harriet mentioned the value of open educational resources. There's research now that has shown that when you use an expensive textbook, um, students, low income students are at a disadvantage in the class because even if they eventually buy the textbook, many of them are unable to buy the textbook until um, a, their first financial aid check comes through. So, you know, oftentimes faculty don't think about this when we're selecting the textbook, um, but that's one way that you can be creating a barrier that you don't even realize. Um, you also want the content to be accessible. So I think faculty need to really think hard about what are the specific skills that we are trying to teach and separate out students' abilities in areas that don't relate to that skill. And one big example of this is if you're, for example, trying to teach biology, you aren't really trying to teach English. And so if you pick a textbook that has very long convoluted sentence structure, then you'll be unfairly penalizing a student whose first language is in English or whose, less, whose reading abilities are less strong. Um, and that doesn't have to do with the content, the science content that you're trying to teach. So obviously there's times where you need a complicated sentence to describe a complicated idea, but we really have to be thoughtful about um, using materials that are as accessible as possible so that the difficulty of the content has to do with the difficulty of what you're trying to teach and not other difficulty. Um, and so that brings me to the second point, which is we need to limit reliance on materials that haven't been taught. Um, so every time you're looking at either an assignment in your own class or if you're consulting with a faculty member, really ask yourself and the faculty member the question, has this been taught? And is this something that's necessary for the student to master given the learning outcomes for your class? So really tightening that alignment. Um, and if it's something that was taught in a previous class, you know, for transfer students, for example, they may not have taken the class at your institution. So providing links to online materials that can provide a refresher for, for information that you expect students to have um, is a way to improve the inclusivity of the content. And so that's this idea of scaffolding with links to just-in-time information. Ideally, culturally responsive pedagogy tells us that we should um, ask students to do difficult work um, and give them confidence that we believe they can succeed. And a great way to do this is to build students up by starting off on assignments that are very simple and then scaffolding increasingly more difficult assignments um, while giving students positive feedback towards growth on each assignment. Um, so for example, you know, if you have a first assignment that is quite basic 
but a student maybe doesn't have that basic skill, then you provide the positive feedback. You know, you did this part right, but you, you missed this element of it. And here's a quick open educational resource video you can watch that goes over that content. You know, we've all been creating a lot of online content due to COVID-19. And so making use of some of those video lectures in this way is a great way when we hopefully return to in-person teaching that you can make use of the work you're doing right now. Um, another great thing to do is to actually get some of your students to record video tutorials describing problems, answers to problems that students have with previous information that they should know. Um, the double advantage of this is I know in many faculty, we're working really hard to have the diversity of our faculty reflect the diversity of our students, but we are not there. And so if you select students from diverse backgrounds to provide those video tutorials, then you're modeling to other students um, a nice diverse set of role models that may well be more reflective um, and representative of your student body than the faculty are. Um, using rubrics is another really great way to increase inclusive content. In a rubric, you outline exactly what it is you're expecting students to do to get a full credit on an assignment. Um, and when you give students rubrics ahead of assignments, they can provide a lot of detailed information about what's expected for success. So the first thing they do is they, they make the content more inclusive for students by explicitly telling students what they need to do and know. And the second thing they do is they remove some of the bias in grading because they keep the faculty members attention focused on what they said that the student needed to do. Um, so for example, there was a college that started using rubrics to evaluate admissions essays and focused the evaluators attention on students demonstrating critical thinking and analysis in the essays and away from grammar and vocabulary. And what they found was they admitted a more diverse student body, a freshman class that was equally successful. So when a faculty member has a rubric, and we aren't saying that we're measuring how beautifully a student writes because that doesn't matter to a course. If it's not in the rubric, it helps us remember that we're not doing that. Um, next, and this is related to rubrics, is include clear and explicit instructions. So you recall that Harriet was talking about how um, when, you know, I've, I've talked to faculty where they're like, oh, I want students to be creative. I don't want to overburden them with rules. But the problem is most of us have expectations in our minds, whether or not we share them with the students. And nine times out of 10, the faculty member who says they want to leave it up to the student to do what they want, when they're grading, they're not grading all students equally. They have an internal set of rules and expectations. And so to be inclusive, you want to share those with students so everybody is on an even playing field. Um, the more detail you put into what's expected in an assignment, what's required in an assignment, and how assignment will be graded, the less likely you are to be privileging the students of privilege who've already had experiences with those sorts of assignments and just know from that experience what they should and should not include. Um, and then finally, you want to create an inclusive environment. So this involves um, using blind grading whenever possible and telling students you're doing that. So ask students to put their names on the back of a paper instead of the front. Um, avoiding the use of things like lockdown browsers, which can invoke stereotype threat because students feel that you believe they're going to cheat or you're suspicious and that increased anxiety can hurt students. Um, and by whatever possible, diversifying both faculty and teaching support staff. So, you know, many institutions are limited by the fact that tenure track lines come around slowly and it's hard to make real changes in faculty. But when you're thinking about teaching assistants um, and adjuncts and other places where you can bring in more diversity more quickly, making the effort to do that um, will make all of your content more inclusive. So finally, um, the elephant in the room is tests. And we work at a very large institution, nearly 30,000 students. And as Christine mentioned, many of our faculty are relying heavily on tests because they're teaching really large classes without a lot of grading support. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do you increase the 
utility value and inclusive content of tests. So first, um, to increase the inclusive content, one really great technique is to have students provide feedback on questions prior to the test. Um, so that can be a teaching assistant, especially if you have an undergraduate teaching assistant, or you can give all of your students, you know, all your test questions. There's even research that has shown that letting students take a test on the first day of a class um, helps them learn later in the class because it makes them focus on what they don't know. So you can give your final exam on the first day of the class and ask students to go through it and tell you what they don't understand aside from the content. Um, and you know, people are really worried about students stealing tests and things like that. And I get it, um, but you know, if you did that and collected it and then didn't even give that test one semester to give it the next semester and do it with a whole bank of questions, what you really wanna find out there is what are the things that are confusing students besides your content, right? Besides the stuff that they should know. Um, so, you know, when I taught child development, I had exam questions on correlations and I learned that my students didn't all understand the decimals that I was using um, in there, which, you know, I started teaching that when I taught correlation, but I wasn't really in those questions. I was trying to see if they understood how, what the size of a correlation meant, but I was really testing something that they should have learned in high school math. And so it's only when you ask students these questions that you learn what's actually causing them barriers that you haven't thought of. Um, the second thing is encourage questioning during testing. When we're testing remotely, this can be via a, a text to you or an email. Um, but in class, I always encourage students to raise their hands and ask me questions. And the really key thing is when the student asks a question about something that doesn't relate to the content you've taught, right? That's when they're telling you that you made an error of inclusivity in your test. And don't just answer the student, tell the whole class. Um, and you know, if you have students that are taking a test in a testing center, I've arranged so that I can email somebody in the testing center with that additional information. And that accomplishes two things. The first is it rewards the student for asking the question, right? Because instead of the student feeling ashamed and embarrassed that they came down in front of the whole class to ask a question, now they're being held up as pointing something out that's gonna benefit the whole class. So it kind of turns them into a hero. And the second thing is, you know, oftentimes the students who are brave enough to ask questions are the students that have more privilege of one kind or another. And so it's, evening the playing field because when you share that answer out with the whole class, you're providing everybody with the information that the person who asked the question got. So it's not that it's just the person who asked the question who gets the benefit of that, it's the entire class. Um, the next thing that you can do is to use a test blueprint to identify questions within a test that are evoking equity gaps. So we've talked a lot about looking at assignments within a class. And a test blueprint is taking that down to the level of question within test. Um, so if you, many um, online test systems will automatically print out reports of who got which questions wrong. Um, and if you then get data to disaggregate that on the base of privileged group, whether it's underrepresented ethnic minority, um, low income students, transfer students, whatever seems to be the population that's underserved in your institution, then you'll find probably that it's not all 100 questions that are driving the equity gaps in test, rather it's five or six questions. And then if you look at those questions and talk to students about those questions, you may find that it's not actually content knowledge, but it may be something like the ability to parse a complicated sentence that's driving that gap. Um, so, or you may find that there's a gap in knowledge and then that's where you use the just-in-time teaching to try and fix it. Um, the next thing is creating that inclusive environment. So whenever possible, using open book, untimed, give all the questions in advance or give, you know, 40 questions in advance, 10 of which will be on the test. Um, and the less you communicate to students that you're the police looking for the cheaters, um, you know, all that kind of stuff is going to feed the feeling of anxiety among students that sometimes can drive larger equity gaps. And then finally, and I think Harriet mentioned this when she was talking about utility value, 
But you know, if you have to use a timed proctored exam, and some faculty will tell us that they have to do that because students have to be prepared to sit for an exam to be qualified for something like nursing or you know, other majors, then explain that to students, right? Say, this is a skill, learning how to take a timed multiple choice proctored exam, and you need to master this skill because you need to take sit for this licensing exam. Um, and so, Things like that, where you actually explain to students this is a skill worth practicing, can it increase the utility value? So now I'm going to hand you off to Christine, who's going to wrap up our session with some opportunities for you to think about ways that you might um, take some of the things we talked about and use them at your own institution. Thank you, Karen. So You've all heard about the importance of examining assignment types to increase educational equity. You've also heard about utility value and inclusive content and how it can contribute to student success and how these can be improved in assignments. So what I'd like you to do is write a few sentences. I, I, well, what I'd like you to do is to actually pick an assignment in any course, just one, write a few sentences about the level of utility value and inclusive content you think it has. And if the assignment is low in either utility value or and or inclusive content, write three changes that you might make in that assignment. You can press pause now in the recording to reflect and write about these questions. All right, now you've had an opportunity to reflect on your class Let's think a bit broader. Let's think about the university. How might educational equity gaps be investigated at your university? Who should be included in that conversation? What approach should be taken to determine if a gap is present with an, an, an assignment types or competence? Based on your suggested approach, what are the next steps that you might need to get started to address that issue? Now you can press pause on the recording to reflect and write about these questions. Okay, Karen referred and uh, Harriet um, both uh, introduced you to uh, some of these uh, authors uh, in, re in reference to our research. This is an abbreviated list that we used in relationship to assignment types and to help you understand the importance of equity in, in evaluating that in assessment. Lastly, as all good assessment professionals do, we are interested in your feedback and how we might improve. So if you would, please follow this link or scan the QR code and provide your feedback to us. We would like to thank our former grad student, Arna. She helped in cleaning and organizing the data for analysis, which was a, a huge task. If you'd like to contact Karen, myself, or Harriet, please use the email addresses at the bottom of your screen. If so, if you wish to also, if you wish to collaborate with us on a research study using your class, please feel free to email us, us email us as well. We look forward to the time where we can meet you in person. Until then, be safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.